Welcome to the Heliconian. Welcome to Yorkville, Scholar Hazelton, the Park Avenue of Toronto. <laughs> welcome, you, you're welcome. And you're welcome to turn off your sound and mini devices, telephones, and the show here. We're going to talk about Archie and the Hedabell tonight. The show is about New York. And it's about two unusual characters invented a century ago by a journalist named Don Marcus. We're going to tell you about these unusual the shows about New York. And we're going to tell you about these two unusual street smart New Yorkers in a minute. But first, you're going to get a song from me about offering to show off New York, written by Irving Berlin. And it goes like, Take me slumming, let's go slumming, let's go slumming on Park Avenue. Let us hide behind a pair of fancy glasses and make faces when a member of the classes passes. Oh, let's go smelling where they're dwelling, sniffing everything the way they do. Let us go to it. They do it, why can't we do it too? Let's go slumming, no slumming on Park Avenue. Thank you. <laughs> Archie and Mehedabel were the Prohibition era inspiration of a journalist who, when he came into work one day, found on his under the Remington Smith Corona a piece of writing <laughs> by Archie who conveniently explained that he was a roach, a cockroach, <laughs> who had transmigrated from a human. Now, if this taxes your imagination, you should know that the need to express is a powerful one. <laughs> whether you're human or insect. In order to communicate, this Archie, the cockroach, has to take a flying leap and land on each key on his head without a crash helmet. This he accomplishes. Now Archie is a kind of, but there's no lower case because he can't reach the shift key. You know, you know, you know. And no punctuation either. Archie is a sort of philosopher and poet. And he also writes about Mehidabel. She's an alley cat that visits the office. And he's fascinated because she's had quite a life too. Everybody needs to express what's inside one way or another. That includes all of you. It's important. If you don't, you'll implode. And if you explode, that's the reason. Expression is the need of my soul. I was once a verse Libra bard, but I died and my soul went into the body of a cockroach. I do see things from the underside now. Thank you, boss, for the uh, apple peelings in the waste paper basket, but your paste is getting so stale I can't eat it anymore. There's a cat here called the Hidden Bell. I wish you'd have her removed. She nearly ate me the other night. Why don't she catch rats? That's what she's supposed to be for. Most of these rats here, they're just rats. But this rat is like me. He has a human soul in him. <laughs> he used to be a poet himself. Night after night, I've written poetry for you and the typewriter here. And this big brute of a rat who used to be a poet, he comes out of his hole when it's done. And he reads it and sniffs at it. He's so jealous of my poetry. He used to make fun of it when we was both human. <laughs> he was a punk poet himself. And then, after he's read it, do you know what he does? He sneers at it, and then he eats it. 
I hope I'll be a rat in the next transmigration and Freddy a cockroach. The rat's name is Freddy. I'll teach him the spirit of my poetry then. Uh, boss, don't you ever eat any sandwiches in your office? I haven't had a crumb of bread for I don't know how long, or a piece of ham, or anything but apple parings and paste. Leave a piece of paper in your machine every night. You can call me Archie. A bit of time goes by. Boss, I am disappointed in some of your readers. They're always asking, how does Archie work the shift key so as to get a new line? They're always interested in technical details, when the main question is whether the stuff is literature or not. I wish you'd leave that book of Walt Whitman's on the floor. May Hitabel the cat and I, we want to read it. I discovered that her soul formerly inhabited a human also. At least that's what the Hitabel's claiming these days. Maybe she just got jealous of my prestige. Anyhow, she and I have been talking over in a friendly way. Who were you, uh, Mehidabel? I asked her. I was Cleopatra once. Well, I said, I suppose you lived in a palace. You <laughs> bet. <laughs> and the lovely fish dinners we used to have. <laughs> and licked her chops. Mehidabel would sell her soul for a plate of fish any day. I told her, I thought she was going to say you were the favorite wife of the Emperor of Valeria. Uh, he was some catnip, eh, Mehidabel? <laughs> but she did not get me. <laughs> All right. The Song of Mehidabel. This is the song of Mehidabel. <laughs> Of Mehidabel the alley cat, as I wrote you before, boss, Mehidabel is a believer in the Pythagorean theory of the transmigration of the soul. She claims formerly her spirit was incarnate, incarnated, I mean, in the body of Cleopatra. That was a long time ago, and one must not be surprised if Mehidabel had forgotten some of her more regal manners. <laughs> what the hell, Archie? Yesterday, scepters and crowns. And today, I heard it bums. But what the hell? What the hell? I keep it and sing and leap. I wake the world from sleep. And I'm pelted with cast off shoes. But what the hell, Archie? What the hell? Do you think? I would change my present freedom? Cage me? And I'd go frantic. I was an innocent kid. And a Maltese cat came by with a kind of hither look in his eye. <laughs> <laughs> and a song that soared in the sky. And I followed him down the street. <laughs> My life is so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing I really regret. The things that I don't want to, I do because I not to. And I end with my favorite motto. Anything. 
Insignificant and journalistic insect, says the royal crackling. In my tender pride, I was too dignified to have anything as vulgar as ambition. The Rara boys of the SETI set were too haughty to be ambitious. We used to spend our time feeding the Ibises and ordering pyramids sent home to try on. But if I had my life to live over again, I would give dignity the royal grass. <laughs> <laughs> Old Tan and Tariq, says I, I detect in your speech the overtones of melancholy. Yes, I am sad, says the majestic mackerel. I am sad as the song of a Sudanese jackal wailing for the blood red wood he cannot reach and rape. On what are you brooding with such a wistful wishfulness? Confide in me. My imperial pretzel. I brood on beer. My scampering whiffle snoot. On beer, says he. My sympathies are with your royal dryness, says I. I am dry. I am as dry as the next morning mouth of a dissipated desert with silicon in my esophagus and gravel in my gizzard. Thinking, thinking, thinking of beer. What country is this? Asked the poor prune. <laughs> Your reverend juicelessness. This is a beerless country. <laughs> well, well, says the royal desiccation. My political opponents back home always maintain that I would wind up in hell. And it seems they had the right dope. And with these hopeless words, the unfortunate residual gave a great call of despair and turned to dust and debris right in my face. It being the only time I ever actually saw anybody put the cough into sarcophagus. Arch. <laughs> Mehitable's extensive past. Mehitable claims she's got a human soul also and has transmigrated from body to body. It may be so, boss. You remember I told you she accused herself of being Cleopatra once? I asked her about Antony. Antony who? She asked me. <laughs> Are you thinking of the song about Rolly and spinach and gammon and I hope for ending you, Rolly? No, I said. <laughs> Mark Antony, the great Roman. The friend of Caesar, surely Cleopatra could remember J. Caesar. Listen, Archie, she said. I met so many prominent gentlemen. <laughs> I wouldn't lie to you, Storm. I do get my dates mixed sometimes. But think of how much I've got a chance that I get. Oh, I have always made a point of never carrying one life over to the next and the grudges. <laughs> oh, I have been treated something fierce in my time, but I have no bums fault. I, I am a free spirit. I, I think of myself as quite a romantic character. I think of the queens I've been. <laughs> and the swell feeds I have ate. A cockroach, which you are. And a poet, which you used to be. But never understand the feelings of having come down to this. But, Choose your name, Archie, after all. And I, I've done so much in my life, but never have I been a, a woman who does housework. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have seen better days. What's the use of kicking, kid? It's all in the game. As a gentleman, 
trying to break into an electric light bulb and fry itself on the wires. <laughs> Why do you fellas do this stunt, I asked him. Because it's the conventional thing for moths? If that had been an uncovered candle and instead of an electric light bulb, you would now be an unsightly cinder. Have you no sense? Plenty of it, he answered. But at times we get tired of using it. <laughs> we get bored with the routine and crave beauty and excitement. Fire is beautiful. And we know that if we get too close, it will kill us. But what does that matter? It is better to be happy for a moment and be burned up with beauty than it is to live a long time and be bored all the while. So we want all our life up into one little rule, and then we shoot that rule. That's what life is for. It's better to be part of beauty for one instant and then cease to exist than to exist forever and never be a part of beauty. Our attitude toward life is easy come, easy go. We're like human beings used to be before they became too civilized to enjoy themselves. And before I could argue him out of his philosophy, he went and emulated himself on a patent cigar lighter. <laughs> I do not agree with it myself. I would rather have half the happiness and twice the longevity, but at the same time, I wish there was something I wanted as badly as he wanted to fry himself. <laughs> Archie, Mahabal has an adventure. <laughs> And I'm glad of it. But there's something about the suburbs that gets on a tall lady's nerves. Fat, slick tabbies, sitting around those country clubs and locking up the cream of existence. None of that for me. Give me the alley. Thank <laughs> you. 
Sometimes I think the kind of thing would be to just 
things and dropped it in the river. <laughs> Trump 
lying in an alley in Greenwich Village. And she's in company with the most villainous Tom Cat I've ever seen. There's something wrong with the association, Archie. It is merely a plutonic attachment. <laughs> and the thing can be believed that the Tom looks like one of Pluto's demons. <laughs> Uh, 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 
uh, gear supply of gasoline, <laughs> covering for the living room, a vacuum instead of a blasted room, not to mention a 40 inch television set. So, although seven and a half cents doesn't buy a hell of a lot, seven and a half cents isn't very much. Give it to me every hour, every week, every day. That's enough for me to be living like a king. <laughs> <laughs> it's called inspiration. Inspiration! <laughs> Excuse me if my writing is out of alignment, boss. I fell into a bowl of eggnog the other day at the uh, tavern down at the street, which the doctor says he's glad to hear you're keeping away from. And when I emerged, I was full of happy inspirations. Alas, they vanished ere the break of day. I'm sure they were the most brilliant and witty things that ever emanated from the mind of man, a cockroach or poet. I sat inside a mince pie and laughed and laughed at them myself. The world seemed all one golden glory, boss. I came up the street to get all this wonderful stuff on the paper for you, but when I tried to operate the typewriter, my foot slipped, and by the time I had control of the machine again, the thoughts had gone forever. It is the tragedy of the artist. Archie. Mehitable tries companionate marriage. <laughs> Boss, I saw Mehitable the cat again, and she's just been through another matrimonial experience. She said in part as follows. I'm always the sad part. <laughs> always believing in the good intentions of these deceitful Tom cats. It is wrong for an artist to marry. A free spirit has got to live their own life. About three months ago, a Maltese tongue with a black heart <laughs> came out. May Annabelle be mine. I am offering marriage. Honorable, up-to-date, companionate marriage. Well, I says, this marriage, there's a catch in it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any kind of marriage means one damn kitten after another. <laughs> <laughs> and domesticity ruins my art. Remind me. Foraging about for something to eat, 
We got caught on a pallet, smid over with all the colors thereof, leaping from this danger. Seven or eight of us landed upon an untouched canvas and stood on an easel nearby, waiting for the master's hand. And we walked across the canvas on our way out of that place. <laughs> Seems we built it better than we knew, boss. Before we could get to any safer place than a spot behind a gas radiator, we heard human footsteps approaching, and an instant later, two men entered the studio. One of them switched on the lights, and the other gave an exclamation of pleasure and astonishment. By Jove, Tommy, he said to the owner of the studio, what is this new thing that goes on the easel? It's the best thing you've done yet. <laughs> I thought you were against modernism and all that newfangled stuff, but I see that you've come over to the new school. Your style has loosened up wonderfully, old kid. I always said that if you could only get away from the stiffness and absurdity of the conventional schools, you had the makings of a great painter in you. What do you call this picture, Tommy? Well, said Tommy, with rare presence of mind. I, I, uh, I've not named it yet. It, it's not altogether in the newer module, observe. I, I've been struggling for a compromise between the two methods uh, that would at the same time allow me to express my individuality on canvas. I, I do think myself I've got more freshness and directness into this thing. You have, said his friend. It has the direct and naive approach of the primitives, and it also has all that is worthy to be retained of the reticent sophistication of the post pre raphaelite <laughs> uh, But what do you say you're going to call it? Uh, it is, said Tommy, as you see, a nocturne. Uh, I've, I've been thinking of calling it um, Impressions of Brooklyn Bridge in a Fog. <laughs> and when his friend went out, he stood and looked at it for a long time and said, Now I wonder who in hell slipped in here and did that. <laughs> it's nothing short of genius. Could I myself have done it when I was drunk? <laughs> I must have. Anyhow, I'll sign it. And taking up a brush, he did so. Well, I stole a look at that canvas myself, and it looked like nothing on earth to me but a canvas over which a lot of cockroaches had walked. <laughs> I may not be a critic, but still I know what I don't like. <laughs> Yours for another renaissance of the arts every spring and every autumn. Archie. <laughs>
Prince, ere you pull the bluff and lie, before you fake and play the snide, consider whether I choose nigh. I see things from the underside. <laughs> Cheerio, my deario. <laughs> well, boys, I met the hit of a cat trying to dig a frozen lamb chop out of the snow drift the other day. She says. Who is out of her ex? 
It can be Oedipus Rex. Where a chap kills his father and causes a lot of bother. A clerk who is thrown out of work. By the skirt who is doing it dirt. By the boss who is thrown for a loss. The world is a stage. The stage is a world of entertainment. The doubt. When the jury is out for the thrill. When they're reading the will or the chase for the man with the face, that's entertainment. The dame, who is known as the flame of the king of an underworld ring, he's an ape who won't let her escape. That's entertainment. Well, the bit that might be a fight like you see on the screen, a swing getting slain for the love of a queen. Some great Shakespearean scene where a ghost and a prince meet and everyone ends in its feet and the <laughs> who looks up from a rug at a cat. Who can love the rat? She can set dance if you give her a chance. The world 